Hello and welcome back to A Better World. This is your host Mitchell J. Rabin and we're very glad you're joining us again today. Today we're going to have another really very interesting show. We have invited back Andrew Harvey, mystical scholar, author, and translator of Rumi. Last time we had Andrew on, we talked about sacred activism, a subject dear to both of us, deep in our hearts. We understand the principles of and the importance of the deep value of this perspective. Well, right behind that and looming over and around that is the beauty and the wisdom of the words of Rumi. And so today, that will be our focus. Andrew, who has translated Rumi and has spent just countless hours poring over the magnificence of his words, the wisdom and love in his words, will be speaking with us today about this beautiful subject. Lovely to be here. Great to have you. In celebration of Rumi. Indeed. I can't imagine my life without Rumi. Mm. You I'm have been a, a student, a deep devotee actually, of Rumi's for many years. 30 years. Oh, 30 God. years. And every year my feeling for him grows deeper and every year my gratitude for what he's given me grows deeper. So and that means you started reading Rumi when you were about two. I uh, wish. No. <laughs> 25. <laughs> I was in Oxford and I had a wonderful tutor who introduced me to Arbery's translations of Rumi. And although I didn't understand anything, I realized that there was in that poetry an immense presence. But let's begin with the poetry. And Why don't we? Would you please it. read and we'll just set the ambiance after accordingly? You. After you. Oh, Why don't really? You read? Oh, oh, Andrew. All right. This is also from, let me say, a well bookmarked <laughs> uh, dog eared copy of Andrew's book, Light Upon Light Inspirations from Rumi. So uh, that's still available, I'm sure. This is entitled Each Moment. Each moment from all sides rushes to us the call of love. We are running to contemplate its vast green field. Do you want to come with us? This is not the time to stay at home, but to go out and give yourself to the garden. The dawn of joy has arisen, and this is the moment of union, of vision. O king, master of this time, awaken from your drugged sleep. Straddle the horse of joy. It is here, the moment, of our reunion. The drum of the coming true of promises is beating. The pathway of heaven is being swept. Your joy is now. What remains for tomorrow is ash. The horses of day have put to flight the armies of the night, and heaven and earth are full of the purity. And this one, love's horse will carry you home. The whole world could be choked with thorns. A lover's heart will stay a rose garden. The wheel of heaven could wind to a halt. The world of lovers will go on turning. Even if every being grew sad, a lover's soul will still stay fresh, vibrant, light. Are all the candles out? Hand them to a lover. A lover shoots out a hundred thousand fires. A lover may be solitary, but she is never alone. For companion, she has always the hidden beloved. The drunkenness of lovers comes from the soul, and love's companion stays hidden in secret. Love cannot be deceived by a hundred promises. It knows how innumerable the ploys of seducers are. Wherever you find a lover on a bed of pain, you find the beloved right by her bedside. Mount the stallion of love and do not fear the path. Love's stallion knows the way exactly. With one leap, love's horse will carry you home, however black with obstacles the way may be. The soul of a real lover spurns all animal fodder, only in the wine of bliss can her soul find peace.
through the grace of my beloved Shamsuddin of Tabriz, may you possess a heart at once drunk and supremely lucid. Well, we're drunk, ah, and I hope supremely lucid. Hell bouquet, I tell you. It's amazing. <laughs> really. Such so beautiful. astounding beauty and such purity of spiritual knowledge and such passion and such unbelievable sincerity altogether. That's yeah. really what characterizes him. And a succinctness as yes. well. I mean, this is one of the things that he's world-renowned for, yes. to say so much in so little. Yes, I think he is speaking from superconsciousness. I think the divine took him to that miraculous place where he was totally suffused with divine love and divine knowledge and divine peace and divine passion, but still able to communicate to human beings what he knew, what he was feeling. Yeah. And that is a almost in human language. Position. In human, in human language. language. And language that can radiate out its meanings to anybody at whatever stage of awakening they are. That's what makes him so extraordinary, I think. If you think, Andrew, that this was written in the 13th century, yes. and here we are in the 21st enjoying its bouquet, yes. I mean, there are many other poets who have come along. Well, many, but you know, what Rumi is is a unique figure in the history of humanity because he combines three things that I don't think anybody else has ever combined. He combines the realization and the soul force and the grandeur of maj majesty of understanding of a Buddha or a or Christ, or a Muhammad, even, mm -hmm. with the extraordinary philosophical understanding of a Plato or a Kant, he combines those two things with the literary gifts of a Shakespeare. Yeah. This has exactly. never happened. That's right. So you this have a Shakespeare who is also a Buddha Jesus, who is also right. a fierce and clean and clear spiritual philosopher, and that fusion of three unbelievably gifts at the yes. highest alchemical level is what lies behind this poetry exactly. and one reason why it not only has lasted but actually now is enjoying a renaissance on a world scale. Exactly. Just that phrase in the poem you read, uh, she may be solitary but she is never alone. Right. I mean, I mean, it does, oh. there and the can't heart be a heart that doesn't lucid. get touched. Right, exactly. Right. Exactly. I mean, it's just, a delicacy of distinction that you could just sup from and savor, you know? Absolutely. Let's uh, speak, because there is such depth and richness, as we were saying earlier, in and teachings yes. inside the poetry. Uh, we were speaking earlier about covering three basic tenets, if you will, of Rumi's poetry. And then we'll carry on in a subsequent show with a few others. Right. Can we well, come back to that? Let's just talk initially about why is his poetry coming back at this moment? Yeah. Why is this poetry undergoing such an extraordinary renaissance? I think there are three main reasons, and they're very powerful. One is that although he's a Muslim, and he was a very serious Muslim and a very practicing Muslim, and he's inconceivable without Muslim mysticism and without the example of Well, Muhammad he is really considered to, in a sense, be very much um, certainly one of the birthers of the Sufi. Of well, he actually, the Sufi mystical tradition was birthed in the 9th century. He was born in the 13th. Right. And there were 400 years of really extraordinary Sufi masters is that and mystics so? who were the kind of soil from which he flowered. Uh -huh. And in many ways, he's the rose of glory of that tradition. But his roots go very deep into Attar, for example, and Saadi, and Rabia, and al halaj these great names. And of course, Muhammad oh. himself, who was a very great mystic. So although he was a Muslim, and one cannot forget them, shouldn't forget that, the kind of mysticism that grew from his realization was one that embraced all paths. All roads, he said, lead to the Kaaba, the black stone at the core of the Muslim yes. vision. Yes. And he, again and again, he says, whatever path you are on, come to me because I am living in joy and I want to share this joy with you. So that, I think, is the first reason why the poetry is having such mm -hmm. tremendous, because it's all embracing anybody on any path.
whether you're a Buddhist or a Hindu or an agnostic or a Christian or a lapsed exactly. Catholic, a you can lapsed. feel <laughs> that this man is speaking your language of love. Well, they say that the Sufi is really the embodiment and the heart of all religions yes. and is not a religion one at all. Well, that's debatable. I think that it's a mistake, actually, to see the Sufi mystical tradition um, separate, separate from, from Islam. From Islam because right. that it is actually, certainly the uh, soil from which it sprang. Well, and also Muhammad's realization was a total one. And the Sufis drew their very deepest inspiration from Muhammad's own example, his life, and the secret sacred sayings, the hadiths of Muhammad, one mm -hmm. of which, you know, he said, he who knows himself knows his Lord. And another one he says, God says speaking, I was um, a hidden treasure and wanted to be known. So there are these cryptic but very luminous insights into Muhammad's Christian realization. to me, however. Oh, no, 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 there's nothing Christian about it. Because in the center of Muslim mysticism, of Muhammad's mysticism, was a vision of the creation as being a manifestation of God's mercy. And we'll be talking about that. Yeah. So I think the first reason is that he has an all-embracing vision, the path mm -hmm. which accepts all other paths. That touches people upon, really need that. That has now. a universal spirit. Right. The second reason... Cross-religious. Exactly. Intercultural, interfaith, everything. <laughs> right. And that is absolutely at the core of our modern impulses. Pan-religious. Well, right. And we're all <laughs> looking for a universal language of God. And yeah. the, he has found it and he speaks it. The second reason is, I think... And by the way, just to add to that, we are in a time of transcendence of outer identification. Well, I wish we were. We're in a time of fundamentalist fanaticism, actually. Well... But there are some people, thank God, who are waking up As we realize, know, God speaks through paradox. Ah. So, agree, agreed. There is that rise of fanaticism and well, fundamentalism. It's threatening the world. Clearly. Right. Understood. Right. At the same time, there is another group right. that are going beyond all outer identification. That's right. It's that's just interesting the way these two coincide. That's why I was raising the question. No, you're quite right. Absolutely. Okay. But please go on. No, no. The second one is that, you know, Rumi is a great philosopher. Rumi it could have been a great teacher in, in the fashion of Ramakrishna or Jesus or Socrates. But yeah. he chose to be a poet or God chose him to be a poet. Mm -hmm. And I think that's another reason for why he is so beloved. Because he doesn't preach at us. He doesn't tell us what to do. He doesn't bring us a series of commandments, what he does is represent in language the deepest ecstatic and tender and wild inner experience. And mm. he represents it as a lover, a lover of the divine beloved. Exactly. And so every lover, which is all of us, because we are all desperate for love and desperate yep. to fall in love and desperate to experience love at all the different levels of love, Every human being who is a lover can identify with him. And I think that's exactly. a, a clue to the core of his appeal. First of all, he's using art as the expression right. of his ideas. That right. touches the heart and soul of most everyone. I don't know whether they were ideas. I think that Rumi transcended ideas. I think Rumi was living in the divine experience. And he used art as the most natural language to express the plasticity, the vibrancy, the fullness, the sensuality, the ecstasy, the passion of authentic divine experience. Because authentic divine experience doesn't have rules. It has a vision and a depth of inner feeling, which art is actually wonderfully equipped to transmit. And but since you mentioned that he is in also the um, philosophical richness of a Plato, Right. There is also the divine idea. There is. That there is are, being expressed through his being. That's true. He is a, he's, that's, I see what you mean. He's, yeah. he's incarnating the idea with a capital I. The, it wasn't the that he was intellect. seeking to be, and I think this is what you were picking up on, Andrew, uh, he wasn't seeking to be didactic through art. Right. Not that wasn't it. It wasn't a no. calculation. No. It was a being himself. Well, in a sense, I think somebody at his level of realization becomes one with what you could call the divine intellect, the mind of God, right. the heart mind exactly. of God. Exactly. And that that heart mind is installed and speaks naturally yeah. through his work. That's and right. that's through why his life, actually. Through his life and saying. work. Right. right. Exactly. And the third reason, I think, just spins from the second one, and, and that is that 
If you were to characterize Rumi's vision, it would be very much like Jesus's vision. It's a vision of tender, burning communion of love between beings of all kinds. Yes. It goes beyond rules, it goes beyond laws, it goes beyond concepts, and in a certain sense, it goes beyond religion. It is a vision of how human beings and animals and nature can live in tender, burning compassion and reverence. And I think at this moment, when what I hear the you world saying, is so threatened... What I hear you saying is communion. Communion. That there is a, exactly. an inherent, intrinsic, organic communion, exactly. and there's the recognition of that interconnectedness. Well, and, it's, and communion is a very profound word. When you think about it in the Christian context, sure. you have communion, you drink the wine. And, right. you know, Sufis, exactly. for the Sufis, the wine is divine ecstasy. So it's, you drink the wine of divine ecstasy, and that initiates you into the sacred relationship that you have as a lover of the beloved with everything that is. And it's to live this communion that we are born. And it's to experience and savor and rejoice in this communion that we live. It was sacred for Dionysus as well. It was. And there is a Dionysiac aspect of the Sufi revelation. Yeah. Not, I don't think, in, its, in the excesses of Dionysus, but in the sense of that Dionysus brings ecstasy. Mm -hmm. This illumination of communion sure, sure. brings ecstasy. The divine erotic. The divine will. erotic, right, yes. Right. The er but eros were, of the heart. Exactly. Right. But you were saying something I think is so vitally important, Andrew, about the relevance of this to today when you were speaking about the idea of communion right. with the animals, with the trees, with the earth. Right. And with the communion carry with on with that thought. Well, what I'd like to do, I think it would be wonderful, is if we really saw Rumi's message now as having s seven aspects. And mm -hmm. that, you know, we, we thought that we might do three for this one, and then we could plunge into that, because I think as these aspects unfold, we will uncover all the different aspects of this communion. Yes. So the first one that I think is so important for all of us, and that's really at the core of his vision, is that he woke up through his relationship with his spiritual master, Shams of Tabrids, mm -hmm to the supreme secret that had been voiced centuries before by perhaps the first great Sufi mystic in the great line after Muhammad, Al-Halaj, who was actually hung, drawn, and quartered in the main square of Baghdad for proclaiming an al haq which means I am the supreme reality. But what he was saying, of course, was not that Al-Halaj was the supreme reality. He was saying that he was crying out in ecstasy at the unveiling of the profoundest secret of all that is enshrined in all of the mystical traditions, that at the core of us burns the eternal divine consciousness. And, Rumi's and it poetry, is here. It's here. It is it's here. inside us. We right. inherit it. It's the original blessing with which we come in. Exactly. And at this time, Mitchell, when we are threatened by such despair and chaos and meaninglessness and desolation, the praise and ecstatic celebration of this divine identity in Rumi's poetry mm -hmm. and his shameless, shameless <laughs> glorying in it on his own behalf but on the behalf of all of us exactly. is something that we need like oxygen for our survival. Right. So right, I thought right, right. I'd ask you to read one of the poems of divine identity. You're surprising then, me, Andrew. And then I will read you another one. Beautiful. But this one is so beautiful. These are six lines which contain the meaning of life. Oh. And they so quickly are so that beautiful. underscores that point I made earlier of succinctness. Oh God! Bless. God bless him. The wine and the cup. The wine of divine grace is limitless. All limits come only from the fault of the cup. Moonlight. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, my glasses here, please. Moonlight floods the whole sky from horizon to horizon. How much it can fill your room depends on its windows. Grant a great dignity, my friend, to the cup of your life. Love has designed it to hold his eternal wine. See, that's so amazing because that line, moonlight floods the whole sky from horizon to horizon, actually refers to the supreme mystical experience mm. in what the Hindus call Nivikalpa Samadhi. When you wake up completely, this vanishes. The yes. whole world disappears into divine light, which is the world the diamond white it. light. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
So that is always going on. This world is always a manifestation of that divine light. And how much that light can fill your room depends on its windows. How open yes. are you? Are you prepared to give up your concepts and your ideas of what God is? Are you prepared exactly. to open your soul totally to the beloved? If you are, then one day you will be given this supreme ecstatic experience and know that there is nothing here but God. As the, you know, said in the Shahada, La ilaha illallah, La yes. ilaha, there is no other God but God. But and that's God, the right. mantra, of course, that Rumi used. Of course, of and course. This is what that state feels yep. like. Here he is describing it, yep. and here he is speaking from within it. Exactly. And one of the ways in which Rumi wrote was to cling onto a pillar. He didn't write anything, actually. He got into a state of trance, and he got into a state of ecstasy. He was in a deep spiritual immersion, and then these torrential golden words would pour from him, and they would be taken down. Mm -hmm. So you imagine him dancing in this ecstatic state. That's a good state. point, though, that he was really carrying through the oral tradition oh yes inherently yes and it's just that people penned it yes and but that's what was how so we have it. about the way in which he did it is that it came out in flawless couplets right. because right. he was connected with what the hindus call paravak the eternal word yes. and it sculpted itself in this perfect literary exactly. way through him it's an amazing the local film. manifest the local manifestation <laughs> <laughs> well here is the local manifesting the, the absolute divine and this poem is really his poem about himself, but I think it's also his, his challenge to all of us to stop hiding in our small identities and to claim mm -hmm. the rapture and power of our divine identity. Define and narrow me, you starve yourself of yourself. Nail me down in a box of cold words, that box is your coffin. I do not know who I am. I am in astounded, lucid confusion. I am not a Christian, I am not a Jew, I am not a Zoroastrian, and I am not even a Muslim. I do not belong to the land or to any known or unknown sea. Nature cannot own or claim me, nor can heaven, nor can India, China, Bulgaria. My birthplace is placelessness, my sign to have and give no sign. You say you see my mouth, my ears, my eyes, my nose. They are not mine. I am the life of life. I am that cat, this stone, no one. I have thrown duality away like an old dish rag, and I see and know all times and worlds as one, one, always one. So what do I have to do to get you to admit who is speaking? Admit it and change everything. This is your own voice echoing off the walls of God. This is your own voice echoing off the walls of God. I love the way that poem ends. And he just says, okay, you think this is just me? No, no, no. I am speaking as the I in you. And that I is eternal, it's deathless, it's strong, it's pure, it's peaceful and passionate. And the whole point of being on this earth is to learn that truth and then to embody that truth. Absolutely. I and thou are one. I and thou are not two. And the mystery <laughs> oh, of the relationship. Because yes. uh -huh. it's one is, yeah. we have, ah. Yes. Yes. The second In the aspect. timeless moment is, yeah. That is so awesome. That is so beautiful. It's, it's really something it's that we will never, ever, truly. ever recover from. I think the beauty of that secret that we all carry. The second aspect I think yes. this is so important is his vision of the creation because we're killing the creation because we simply don't know what it is. And we do not hold it as sacred. And we do not see it as sacred. And I wanted to read just a short excerpt before we part of this amazing, amazing vision that he had. If I can find it. Can you, you can and as it. you're And as you're looking... Uh, it just deserves to be said that the richness of the language, the understanding of the human as a container of the sacred. I was thinking actually when you were yes. talking about the cup and the windows into the cup is the Aldous Huxley's, uh, the doors of perception. Right. And when they get cleared and opened, so too it emits the light. Exactly. And one day maybe you'll have no windows, but just be glass, like Philip Johnson's glass house. Perhaps that's what a band like Rumi really it's is. It's interesting. Right. <laughs> this one is his vision of the creation as an epiphany of God. You know, 
So many of the religious traditions tell us the world is an illusion, but the world is not an illusion. It is a glorious and expression. sacred expression or epiphania, yes. epiphany flaming out of the glory of God. Adore and love him with your whole being, and he will reveal to you that each thing in the universe is a vessel full to the brim with wisdom and beauty. Each thing he will show you is one drop from the boundless river of his infinite beauty. He will take away the veil that hides the splendor of each thing that exists. And you will see that each thing is a hidden treasure because of its divine fullness. And you will know that each thing has already exploded stilly and silently and made the earth more brilliant than any heaven. At his summoning, all things have sprung up and made the earth more magnificent than an emperor wearing a robe of the most resplendent satin. If we could see the world like that, we would do everything to preserve it. Absolutely. <laughs> we began with Rumi and we complete with Rumi. Bless you, Andrew. Thank you for joining us. I look forward to seeing you next week. And stay tuned for a continuation of this as we continue to explore Rumi during this year of his 800th anniversary. Hello and welcome back to A Better World. This is your host, Mitchell J. Rabin, and we are